Hello, <coughs> welcome to the 11th uh, <coughs> module of the Applied Linguistics course uh, of uh, E-Part Shala of the UGC. And uh, this module is concerned with the, uh, with a more detailed examination of the uh, sapir workian hypothesis and its relationship to language and language teaching. Uh, of course, we will talk about some of these things in more detail in the, in the course on, on social linguistics, but I think uh, it is important for a teacher to know what this perspective tells us about the relationship between language and thought and culture. So that is the uh, culture, very broadly speaking, is a way of life. It, it subsumes everything, uh, your language, your literature, your folk traditions, your, uh, you know, religious practices, your architecture. It subsumes everything. That's, that's your culture. Uh, now, there is a level at which even the early structuralists recognized very clearly that at some level language is sort of completely independent system from anything else, whether it is culture or thought or whatever else. For example, Sapir in 1921 in his famous book on language, he said uh, when it comes to, and this is a very important quote, we will put it on the screen, uh, you will see it now. When it comes to linguistic form, Plato walks with the Macedonian swineherd, Confucius with the head-hunting savage of Assam. Now, Sapir is not here trying to run down, you know, the Assamese or the Macedonians. What Sapir is trying to say is, so far language is concerned, there is no difference between a king and a beggar, okay, between a queen and a maid, you know, there is no difference, or between a great literary writer or a poet and an ordinary man, woman on the street, there is no difference. So where language is concerned, they are equal. So that's what he is, he is trying to say. And uh, uh, in the same vein, I think, uh, Chomsky also suggested that so far language faculty is concerned, you can't divide human beings into different categories. That being human is to have that universal language faculty, okay, but just by being human. Now, coming to culture and language with which the sapir warfian hypothesis is most closely associated, it maintains that the meanings of words may be contingent on the cultural practices. Words don't have their own meaning. You know, they, those are meanings, as we noticed earlier, Wolf and sapir suggested that those meanings are created by the social group in terms of their uh, thoughts and in their culture, but language is the tool with which you see the world. And people give meanings to words. Uh, the meaning of the word wood, for example, is not just wood with a, with a tribe in, in North America. It can also mean a canoe, a kind of a boat. It can mean both the things. So, you know, because they were, they were made out of, out of wood. Uh, we earlier gave the examples of a kinship system that, you know, Indian speakers would see the kinship system in one way and uh, through one kind of prism of language and uh, the Westerners would see it in another way. And there have also been examples of colors and of ice, you know, that Eskimos have many words for ice, it is said. But increasingly, it is being shown that that may not be the case. At a later stage, we will talk more about this. At the moment, it is important to understand that people like Sapi and Wolf very strongly argued that we see the world around us 
through our language. And the language tells us what, what the world is like. The categories are there. Uh, the other person we must name in this context is uh, J.R. Firth, who also worked in India, uh, British, well-known British linguist, who set up the theory of context of situation to, to show that there has to be a contextual theory of meaning, that unless there is a context, unless we know who is talking to whom, when and where, and for what purpose, with what motivation, you cannot deconstruct the meaning of a particular sentence. So context is that important, as we said earlier also. And language expresses cultural reality. Language also embodies cultural identity. So, you know, once again, for Firth also, it was very important uh, that language encapsulates culture and it reveals individual's identity. And it is only through language that you transmit cultural patterns to the next generation. In the sapir Wharf hypothesis, Wharf originally was an insurance agent and uh, he was Sapir's student. And the, 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 famous, uh, the famous story, you know, that goes is that when he was invited, uh, he was asked by a company to examine a fire and give the estimates in a factory, you know, in a gasoline factory. So he went there and he tried to figure out that what could possibly be the reason for, for this fire, you know, uh, suddenly and this big fire, you know, and, uh, the costs were huge for an insurance agent. So he wanted to understand that what was going on. Uh, to his surprise, the uh, uh, Worf realized that the cam, the, the sort of huge cam or drum, you might say, lying outside, said empty. So that means oil had been emptied out of it. But obviously some layers were inside it. So somebody, a person who used to work there but didn't understand, didn't appreciate the full significance of what it means to say that it's empty, he lit a cigarette and flipped the matchstick into the, into the drum and there was fire. And that is when Worf started thinking, he was not a native speaker of English, I guess. Then Worf started thinking that it is language which determines how we look at the world. And then he became a student and learned everything about language that he could and presented the world with this very powerful hypothesis that language determines, decides how, how we will cut the nature up. In English we say a light flashed. While so there is uh, the phrase a light divided into a determiner and the noun light, so a light, and flashed, which is a verb on which the past tense has been marked. Uh, when you see a light flashing, you say, oh, a light flashed. But in Hopi, the same meaning is expressed by one simple word, which is repi, which is just means light, light flashed or light occurred. So the noun and the verb both of them are subsumed in one word. So the action of flashing and the agent of light are combined. So the whole idea of subject and predicate are gone in Hopi for that time. It is sort of embedded in a single word. That was Wolf's claim. So it is the way, the way we will look at the world will depend on what our language tells us to see. That's, that's what uh, Worf said. And he said, if, if your language, he says, our, our perception of languages has been far too conditioned by the Western models of looking at language in terms of subject and predicate. And the agreement between subject and predicate, like Ram is the subject, Seb is the object, Ram, Seb 
खाता है सीता सेब खाती है सो सब्जेक्ट प्रेडिकेट रिलेशनशिप दैट इज वॉट वी आर यूज टू थिंकिंग एंड वी कैन नॉट इवन एंटरटेन एनी अदर लैंग्वेज विच इज स्ट्रक्चर्ड वेरी डिफरेंटली एंड द लैंग्वेज इज स्ट्रक्चर्ड इन सच अ वे दैट द एक्टर एंड द एक्शन आर मर्ज टूगेदर इन सम वे एंड इट मेक्स परफेक्ट सेंस दैट इज हाउ पीपल आर गोइंग टू लुक एट द वर्ल्ड वॉफ्स वर्शन वॉज दैट वी डिसेक्ट नेचर अलॉन्ग लाइन्स लेड डाउन by our native languages and he further said it's on your on your screen this slide is on your screen we cut nature up organize it into concepts and ascribe significance as we do largely because we are parties to an agreement to organize it in the way an agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified in the patterns of our language earlier also we turned to this and i have repeated this here just to remind you that you know that is how we cut nature up this is from the book uh, wolf's book called language thought and reality and from this emerged a very strong hypothesis of linguistic relativity and linguistic determinism now the the theory of linguistic relativity says the following that things in different cultures and different societies are codified differently you know this is a more acceptable position than to say that language alone determines all that we will see all that we will hear all that we will understand so linguistic relativity uh meant that people's perception of the world is relative to the structures of languages they speak whereas linguistic determinism meant thinking cannot take place that there can't be any thinking independent of language uh so that was linguistic determinism and there is a major critique of the sapir whorf hypothesis uh we might say that to some extent you know a linguistic relativity is a little more acceptable than linguistic determinism but if we were to go far with whorfian hypothesis then we would maintain that uh translation is in principle impossible we'll have to maintain that uh which is also you know coins uh, the great philosopher coin uh famous problem called gava gai problem the problem there was that you know you are sitting with two people whose language you don't know and uh a goat passes by and uh, the person says gava gai to the other person gava gai now the person might think that oh gava gai is the word for goat or or and and he may be or or maybe it's a white goat so he may think gava gai is the word for white goat but for all you know this may be the word for a goat running past the river let's say or it could mean something very different that you know uh, the goat is looking for grass so we don't know so the gava gai problem fundamentally says it is impossible to translate and it is it is in the spirit of the whorfian hypothesis you know because languages belong to specific cultures and those languages decide how we see how we cut up nature and how language influences our th total thought processes but still we translate all the time you know we are translating and unless there were translations available we will for example in india we will not know anything about greek or latin literature we know about it because it is available in english and and many people might think you know even today that sophocles or homer or euripides they wrote in english you know what wrote in greek and they are available to us because 
if translations were made possible in in uh, in English and and various other languages. Consider, for example, the you know culturally located or culturally rooted rooted uh, terms. Say from Hindi, uh, take the word janyau, or take the word dupatta. Now janyau has you know the thread, the sacred thread, generally translated as sacred thread, which doesn't mean you know uh, which may not have anything to do with you know the sacred thread cannot convey in any sense the total meaning that is associated with uh, the concept of janyau. You know, the, the culture that goes with it, the, the practices that go with it, and the constraints that go with it later on, you know, that you have to do this while doing this, or while passing urine, you have to do this. So all those things, you know, while you are bathing, you have to do this, etc., etc., while you are performing a ceremony, you have to do this. None of this can convey. You will have to write a footnote. You will commentary on Janyao to give the full meaning. Similarly, Dupatta is not just a scarf, it is, it is a lot more. So people coming from different racial, geographical and cultural backgrounds share often the same language with some minor lexical variations. So how come you say that different geographies, different cultures would create different languages, you know, always, and that that culture, that geography, those surroundings will always be seen through the through the prism of that particular language. So we have very briefly, and this has implications, depends whether you believe in Sapir's hypothesis or not, uh, Sapir Warfin hypothesis or not, your, your whole pedagogical processes may be influenced. And I think, I personally think that there is some modicum of truth to Sapir Warf's hypothesis. But I think uh, languages can be translated, you know, across each other. And uh, we should try to create that kind of imagination and ability among our students that they can understand and appreciate other cultures and write about them in their own languages, rather than languages becoming a barrier to exposure to different cultures and thought. Okay, see you later. Thank you very much.